What's up YouTube, Dr. Ali Hader here. Thanks for checking back into the channel. Today's video, we're gonna be talking about heart blocks, going through the different AV blocks and some bundle branch blocks as well. And hopefully you guys get something out of it. So if you like what you see, hit the like button, please subscribe to the channel and share with your friends. Alright guys, so we're going to dive into it. We're going to be talking today about various types of heart block. Okay, Heart block basically refers to an abnormality in conduction tissue somewhere along the lines of the heart that is causing either slowing or blocking of conduction through a specific pathway. Okay, And this can occur on various levels and we're going to kind of go through all the basics and the salient features here. Okay, So if you saw my first EKG video, you remember this diagram, which is sort of representing the heart's conduction tissue. Okay, up here again is the sinoatrial node at number one. This fires and sends signals across the atrium, which is number two, entering the AV node at number three. The AV node will subsequently send conduction down to the bundle of His, which is the important structure below the AV node which will subsequently send the signals down to two bundles, the left bundle and the right bundle to depolarize the ventricle. So essentially, heart block can occur at any point along these pathways. So let's dive into it. Again, um, the first area uh, that starts the cardiac cycle is again, the sinoatrial node. So if there's a problem in the firing of the sinoatrial node, that's called sick sinus syndrome or sinus node dysfunction. Not really heart block because it's more of an abnormality of the initiation of the signal and not blocking of a conduction path. Now, if there's a problem with the signal actually exiting the sinoatrial node into the atria, that is referred to as sinoatrial exit block. Okay, so that means the sinus node is firing. However, the signal is not manifesting itself within the atrium because there is an abnormality of the conduction leaving the sinoatrial node. We'll um, talk a little bit about that later. That's probably the least important of the blocks, I would say. Now, if there is an abnormality of conduction through the AV node, that's when we start getting into our more common types of block. So at number three, we're gonna see first degree AV block, again, within the AV node or second degree AV block, MOBITS 1, which is a Wenke block block. Again, this is due to high vagal tone, and it usually is the less serious in terms of AV blocks. So those are two types of block that we're gonna see within the level of the AV node. And these are again, often influenced by high vagal tone, medications, etc. Now, when we're getting down to the hiss, this is when we're starting to see more of our advanced blocks. So when we talk about block below the AV node or block below the hiss, we're talking about more advanced types of heart block, okay? So that's when we're gonna be seeing the second degree AV block, MOBITS 2, okay? Or third degree block, block. Essentially, these insinuate more advanced block. Again, anything kind of below this level, all right, which means that there is a much poorer backup system that the heart has to kind of compensate for that block. And these are the ones that can lead to asystole and often require a pacemaker, okay? Now, down here in the bundles, again, normal conduction should go equally down the left bundle and its various fascicles, okay? There is the left posterior fascicle here and the left anterior fascicle here. And of course the right bundle, which has uh, its own fascicle. And the conduction should go down equally down these both pathways to cause uniform depolarization. Now, of course, there can be block in any of these bundles individually, and that can lead to either a left bundle branch block or a right bundle branch block. The left bundle can also have block within each fascicle, the left anterior fascicle causing a left anterior fascicular block or a left posterior fascicular block. So 
basically these are all the areas um, and the classifications of heart block. And our job is to kind of figure out on the EKG where this is occurring and to figure out is this something more concerning like somewhere within here or is this something less concerning like up in the AV node or just sort of in the fascicle. Um, and again, down here in number five, these are going to be blocks that are manifested within the QRS, whereas everything else is sort of manifested um, in the PR interval. So now that you have a basic understanding of what's going on, let's take a look at what to look for on the EKG tracings for these blocks. All right, so let's dive into it. And here we're going to kind of go over what exactly we're going to be looking for on the 12 lead EKG and on telemetry when we're trying to make the diagnoses of these various blocks. So we're going to start with first degree AV block. If you recall, this occurs at number three here in the AV node. This is pretty simple. What we're going to be looking for here is a simple prolongation of the PR interval. So you have a P wave and you have your QRS and the PR interval is greater than 200 milliseconds. Whenever you see this, that is a first degree AV block. You're not going to have any drop beats. You're going to have a consistent PR interval. Second degree AV block Mobitz 1, also known as Wenckebach. This is characterized by a progressive prolongation of the PR interval, where you're going to have a P wave, a QRS, a P wave, longer PR interval, progressive prolonging until you have a drop beat. So you're going to have progressive PR prolongation leading up to it and then eventually a dropped QRS. All right, and this can be in cycles of four to three, meaning four P waves to three QRSs, and it can be three to two, it can vary, and sometimes you'll see a couple of Wenke box cycles uh, amidst uh, normal sinus rhythm. So make sure you take a look at all the tracings and the telemetry to make the diagnosis. In second degree AV block, Mobitz two, this is block occurring below the AV node, so at the level of the his or lower. Here, what we're going to see is PQRS and eventually a drop beat without prolongation of the preceding PR intervals. All right, so this is going to be a repetitive pattern with consistent PR intervals followed by a drop beat. In this example, we have a three to two Mobitz two because you have three P waves for every two QRSs. All right, um, and this can also vary between three to two, two to one, four to three, etc. cetera. And um, again, the key is steady PR intervals. Now, third degree AV block also is occurring at the level of the his or lower, right here. What you're gonna see here is complete AV dissociation. So you're gonna have P waves that are doing their own thing and amidst this, you will have QRX complexes that are at their own rate, not doing anything that the P waves tell them. So there is complete AV dissociation, all right, where the ventricular rhythm is doing its own thing based on its inherent escape rate. So got to look carefully. You can always get this confused with Mobitz 2. I see it happen all the time. But if you use your calipers and you are careful, you'll be able to figure this out. Oftentimes, the QRS rate here is very slow. Look for what the escape rhythm is going to be. Is it wide? Is it narrow? This will give us an idea of where exactly the escape rhythm is coming from. Obviously, if it's wide, this is more concerning and the patient can be more unstable. Now, briefly, which I'm going to talk about afterwards, two to one AV block can be tricky. This can technically be either a Mobitz one or a Mobitz two. And we'll talk a little bit about this in a minute. Now, let's look at the bundle branches and the fascicles. Again, these are going to be abnormalities of the QRS complex. You can get individual block in the fascicles. So if you have a block in the anterior fascicle, left anterior fascicle, which is here, what you're gonna see is a positive deflection in lead one. You'll have a negative deflection in lead two. 
and often you'll have a mini Q wave and lead AVL. This negative lead two pushes the vector towards a left axis and oftentimes you're going to see the QRS duration is going to be between 100 and 120 milliseconds because there is some degree of conduction delay here. In the left posterior fascicular block, what you're going to see is the opposite. Where lead one, the vector is negative. In lead two, you'll get a positive vector. And this is, again, indicative of isolated left posterior fascicular block. This is much less common than a left anterior fascicular block, but you may see it from time to time. Moving on to a left bundle. So if your entire left bundle upstream is blocked, you will get a complete left bundle branch block. Now you're going to see a QRS duration of greater than 120 milliseconds. And how you're going to distinguish that between the left bundle and the right bundle is really looking at two leads, lead V1 and V6. In lead V1, a left bundle is going to give you a QS complex. All right. So you're going to have a QS complex. You're not going to have an R wave here and it's going to be broad and it's going to be wide and it's essentially just one big Q wave. Lead V6 is sort of the opposite. You're going to get sort of this RS complex where you're going to get a broad, often a notched R wave indicative of the conduction delay. A right bundle, on the other hand, again, greater than 120 milliseconds, but in lead V1, it's going to be the opposite. In this case, you're going to get this RSR prime most of the time, which is sort of like the quote bunny ears that we describe, where you're going to have a notch and a delay on the R wave. And in lead V6, what you're going to have is the slurred S wave. All right. This slurred S wave often got me confused in what exactly it meant. Basically, this is occurring because most of the depolarization is rapid and early from the left side, and the slurred S represents the delayed depolarization occurring from the bundle branch, the right bundle branch block. All right, so again, for these two bundles, left and right, if you notice it's greater than 120 milliseconds, look at these two leads and you'll be able to figure this out. So real quick about two to one AV block. Two to one AV block is when you have two P waves for every QRS. So that means every other P wave does not conduct a QRS and you get a drop B, okay? Now this becomes questionable about the level of block. Is it a Mobitz 1 or a Mobitz 2? Because there's every other beat that's dropped, you don't have enough cycles to see could there be prolongation of the PR interval, okay? And it's tempted to call this Mobitz 2, but technically we can't be sure of that. Now, Mobitz 1 is blocked in the AV node, whereas Mobitz 2 is below the AV node, right? So AV nodal block is due to high vagal tone. So if we can manipulate that, this could help us out. If we exercise the patient by walking them or doing some sit-ups, this could decrease vagal tone and improve our block if it's a Mobitz 1. However, if the block were to worsen with exercise, such as go from 2 to 1 to 3 to 2, this is more indicative of Mobitz 2. In the end, call it 2 to 1 AV block, but think about where the block could be. Okay, so we're going to go through a quick example here. Here's a rhythm strip, and we're going to figure out what the type of block is here. First thing to do, identify the P waves. So we see P waves here. Here's one on the T wave, and there are P waves that are just sort of marching through here. And obviously, there's a lot less QRS. All right, so there's more P waves than QRS, already indicative of some sort of block. Next, let's look at the P and the QRS relationships. Is there a relationship here? Here's our PR interval here. Here's another one. Here's another one. All these are different, and it does not appear that there's any potential relationship here, right? So why don't we look at our PP interval now? So this is our P to P interval, and we're going to make sure all our P waves are of the same cycle length. And you can see they are, which means the P waves are firing at their own rate. Now, if we look at the QRS intervals, all right, you'll notice that they are also firing at their own rate. So we have two completely separate rhythms between the P's and the QRS's with no relationship. What is this? This is third degree AV block.